as we continue in our sermon series in Hosea called Relentless Love, I'm, I'm really excited to finally arrive at chapter 11. When I first thought about preaching through Hosea, I was mostly thinking of Hosea's amazing love for his unfaithful wife, Gomer, and what a beautiful picture that is of God's love for unfaithful sinners like us. But as I began to study through the book of Hosea, I was really caught off guard by chapter 11. You see, the, uh, the raw emotion of God breaks through the words here in a way that's striking, to say the least. It's like God pulls back the curtains of his heart and gives us a view at the depths of his love for his sinful people. What we're going to find as we look into God's heart is shocking and encouraging at the same time. Now, I know that I'm going to struggle to do justice with a chapter as beautiful as this one. So I really hope that you're going to reread this chapter a little bit later today and let kind of the word sink in deeply into your heart. And my prayer this morning is that you will find as much hope and encouragement as I have as we go through this beautiful chapter together. Now, we're going to go through it in four parts. We'll, we'll, we'll spend, though, the majority of our time on the third part, which is verses eight and nine, because that's kind of the climax of the chapter and perhaps even the heart of the book of Hosea itself. But before we begin, let's prepare our hearts to receive from God's word through prayer. Will you pray with me? Father, once more we come into your presence and now we just would come before you briefly and ask that you would open up your word with clarity and with power. And God, as we delve into the mysteries of Hosea chapter 11. Lord, may you make it clear to our hearts. Give us ears to hear what you would say to us through this chapter and through these verses. God, help me to, to explain clearly, but even in my stammering and even in my, um, my foolishness, may you use your word with power through the Holy Spirit to bring great conviction. God, if there are some today that aren't saved, we pray that they would desire even more to have you and know you as their Lord and as their heavenly father. And God, may you encourage your saints through these words in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so as, as we look at this here, uh, let me just get my PowerPoint going. As, as we look at this after a chapter full of warnings and condemnation, chapter 11 is a, sort of a different approach by Hosea. It's kind of like a, a shaft or a beam of sunlight through dark, stormy clouds. It begins by looking back at Israel's history as a guide to understanding her relationship with uh, God right now. See, Israel had often been unfaithful, but God was always faithful to them. In verse one, this is a reference to the birth of the nation as God miraculously calls them out of slavery in Egypt. And God places his love on Israel and he calls them his son, which is remarkable. And we might ask, why did he do this? Why did he deliver them? Why did he call them? Well, Deuteronomy 7 gives us the important answer. It says, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all people. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers. Now, that's an interesting explanation for why God loves them, isn't it? It's not because of anything special about you. It's not because you're bigger or better than the other nations. Why? It is because he loves you. Why does he love you? Because he loves you. And because of a promise he made to uh, your fathers, it's a reference to uh, their ancestor, Abraham. But that reference to the promise isn't very helpful either, because Abraham received a promise of blessing from God, and that wasn't because of anything special about him. But again, it is simply God loved them because he loved them. He chose to place his love on them, not because they were lovely, not because they were lovable, but because God is loving. That's why he did it. Um, it was part of God's loving plan. The same could be said of us um, who through faith in Christ have become children of God. God didn't save us because of anything special or meritorious or particularly of note in people and sinners like us. It's because of who he is that he chose to place his love on us through salvation in Christ. If you're a believer, Hosea wants you to understand this morning that God loves you as his child. Yes, we understand that God loves the whole world, 
But for those who've accepted Christ as their Savior, God places his special love upon them. Now, in verse 2, we're confronted with Israel's failure in the face of this amazing love. He calls them out of Egypt, and they were glad to get out of that difficult situation. But after they're free of it, they don't really want to come after him or answer his call anymore. It isn't that they don't want any God, because as we see, they were full of idolatry. They believed all kinds of different gods. They just didn't want him as their God. The more that God called them and pressed them to come, the further they would run from him, the further they went into idolatry. We see here God's patience and his persistence in continuing to call them, even though they were running away. And we see Israel's complete rejection of their God. In verse 3, it really puts a sting to all of this as it furthers this picture of God as father and Israel as the child. It furthers it with something very familiar. If you've ever had kids, and even if you haven't, you know the scene. When toddlers just start to walk, you've, you've seen a father or maybe a mother kind of hold their hands to help hold them as they make their little steps and they try to walk for the first time. Maybe they even take a few steps on their own and they come tumbling down in a burst of tears and the dad picks them up and, and kisses their hurts and comforts them and makes them better. Well, that's how Hosea is saying God loves us. He isn't a distant God, but one who helps us find our feet in this life. One who helps us know where and how to walk through life and who heals our hurts. There's a tenderness in this verse, isn't there? And it makes the rejection of God's love that much worse. God loved us as his own. And when we reject our loving, almost doting heavenly father, it's, it's, a, it's a bitter betrayal of that love. But the metaphor changes in, in verse four, just for verse four, instead of referring to Israel as a son, he's going to refer to Israel as a animal. In fact, this is like an ox or a bull. Now he does this in, to, to further the metaphor and make uh, and to emphasize that Israel is called to obey and follow after God and his commands and to serve God. Now God does lead Israel with ropes, but they aren't ropes of bondage like they knew in Egypt. These are cords of kindness. They're bonds of love. What that's trying to tell us is that God's commands and serving him isn't meant to be slavery, isn't meant to be brutal, isn't meant to trap us or, or hold us back. It's meant to free us. It's meant to, as, a, as care and protection, God loves us in the ways that he wants us to go because he knows they're best for us. That's why he commands us. Now, as he freed Israel from the yoke of slavery in Egypt, here we see him loosening and easing the yoke so it's not heavy or hard upon the animal. And finally, I mean, think about that, this last line here. What farmer have you ever known that bends down and hand feeds his ox or his animals or his cattle? I mean, this is God treating them more like a treasured pet than like a beast of burden. Even in this metaphor, which is a little less flattering, it's still God's tender love and his care shine through. And what we're seeing through verses one to four is that Hosea is emphasizing to us that God loves us as his own, even as his own child. Now, let's reread verses five to seven to see how God outlines the consequences of Israel's failure to accept his love. It says, they shall not return to the land of Egypt, but Assyria shall be their king, because they have refused to return to me. The sword shall rage against their cities and consume the bars of their gates and devour them because of their own counsels. My people are bent on turning away from me, and though they call out to the Most High, he shall not raise them up at all. See, Israel's rejection catches up to them in a disastrous fashion. God won't return Israel to slavery in Egypt, but um, they're going to be carried off into exile by the Assyrians in instead. And what they're going to find is that while they refused God's loving, doting care over them, they will discover that their new master, the king of Assyria, is far less tender and kind than God was going to be to them. In verse 6, we discover why the Israelites rejected God, why they thought, thought they didn't need God, because they had their own counsels, they had their own ideas. They looked at their cities and they said they're strong. They looked at the gates of the cities and said those are thick, nothing will get through. And yet, 
It did not work that way. These false securities were dissolved by, is, by Assyrian aggression as the sword would break through and devour their cities and devour the people of Israel. The foolishness of thinking that they didn't need God in life would be exposed in brutal fashion by the hate and aggression of the Assyrians. Verse 7 describes the heart of Israel in bleak terms, as God concludes that their hearts are bent on turning away from him. Bent has the idea of warped, of always being inclined in the wrong direction, of pointing the wrong way. The problem with something bent is it can be hard to straighten out again. And, and God isn't just saying this about the hearts of Israel, but he's saying this about all of our hearts. We're all sinners. We all have this natural tendency to turn away from him. I feel that in my heart. It should be easy to follow with a God that loves me the way he does, but it's not. If I don't check myself, I naturally drift away from God. I naturally pull back or fall away from him. It's almost like driving a car with steering or alignment issues. It just won't drive straight. It naturally inclines to the right or the left. And if you're not correcting, you'll find yourself off the side of the road or in incoming traffic. Well, the problem is Israel didn't correct. They just kept going. They accept, in fact, they, they just embraced the abandonment of God. And, and that had brutal results upon them. When disaster struck, only then, when they saw all their other options were used up, then they turned back to God. But then he would not answer. Instead, he allowed them to be taken into exile. But this wasn't to destroy them. But this was instead, God knew that through the trials of the exile, this would be a disciplining process, that they would learn to stop trusting in worldly counsel and trust in God's will. They would learn to not come to him last, but to come to him first because he loves them. They would learn to value his incredible love and turn away from the worship of other things in their lives. You see, God allowed this in their lives because he isn't as interested in their comfort as he is in the direction of their hearts. And he knew that the strong discipline of exile would help unbend some of the bentness in their hearts. See, much of Hosea, as we've been studying through, has been about God disciplining his people, turning away from them. And, and, and we should see not just this in the people of Israel, we should see this in our own heart, right? As we've been saying, I love that old hymn, uh, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. It says, um, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Isn't that true? We know that we have this same bentness. And here, God, we need to be warned that God will not put up with our wayward ways forever. But this is how God works. God disciplines those he loves. He'll allow us to go through hard times so that we will learn to value his extraordinary love for us. His disciplining of us is actually a product of how much he loves us. He won't let us continue to veer off the road. He will straighten our course and our path for our own good. So if you're a believer, if you're a child of God and you are living in sin and you know it, or your heart is cold toward God, take warning. Hosea is warning you that God will bring discipline in your life. He will let you face the consequences of your sinful choices. He will let you face them on your own without his help until you learn to come back to him. But Hosea's main message isn't one of warning, actually, but of love. He doesn't try to scare us into coming back to God, but instead he tries to convince us to come back to one who loves us so deeply as God does. And that's exactly where Hosea turns next. After talking about their discipline, he immediately turns to God's love in verses 8 and 9. So let's read how God loves his people even in the midst of disciplining them in verses 8 and 9. It says this, and this is, this is really such powerful words. This is God speaking. And he says, how can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my burning anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst. I will not 
come in wrath. These verses are really the climax of the chapter, and as I've already said, perhaps the heart of the book of Hosea itself. In verse 8, we see God contemplating the just punishment that Israel deserves. They deserve God to abandon them and to treat them like Adma and Zeboim. And you might well say, well, who are they? Well, not who, but what are they? They're actually the lesser known ancient cities that were destroyed along with Sodom and Gomorrah as uh, Deuteronomy 29 makes clear, the whole land burned out with brimstone and salt like that of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and wrath. So Adma and Zeboim in our verse represent complete evil and sin that demands punishment and God's just requirement of complete destruction of such evil. God is looking at Israel's constant betrayal of his love. They're, they're turning away from him to sin. And, and he sees that they deserve complete destruction as a result of this. His justice, his perfect justice, calls out for their destruction. But even while justice calls for that, his heart calls out for something different. See, when, we think, when he thinks of discarding or destroying his people, his heart recoils from such a thought. This is startling language. This is almost a visceral response being attributed to God at the very thought of doing this to the people that he loves. The thought of abandoning or annihilating his people is impossible. It's untenable. He rejects it out of hand. His heart recoils back from the thought of doing this. See, for, for me, these verses are almost scandalous. And how they describe God's heart of love for his people, even as they're in rebellion. And by extension, his heart of love for sinners like you and me. We've seen ourselves in the previous verses where uh, Israel turned from God. We saw our own proneness. But here, God gives us a, a, a surprising and a fascinating window into his heart so that we can see how he feels about us in the middle of our sin, in the middle of our failures, in the middle of our rebellion. What does God feel? Well, in the midst of our sin, God recoils from the thought of condemning us or destroying us because he loves us. This passage is one of the clearest expressions of the heart of God for sinners, not just in the Old Testament, but I would suggest perhaps even in the entire Bible, as God's emotions are described here in very relatable terms. It's surprising because when we think about God's heart, we tend to go in, in three different directions. Some of us might agree more with the ancient Greeks and think that if we have emotions, God has them, but even more. Now, our emotions can sometimes be chaotic. Sometimes they can be evil. And if that's the true of us, it must be even more true of God, right? The Greek gods, they were consumed by, by, uh, by, by envy and anger, and, and lust, and, and greed, and so much more. Um, they just were really, really amplified versions of human beings at their best, but also at their worst, weren't they? God's emotions, though, are different than that. They're not impure. Verse 9 will remind us that he is the Holy One who is above us. So his emotions are never unrighteous. They're always good. And they accompany righteous actions, unlike ours, which are often not good, and accompany far less than righteous actions. So God isn't like the Greeks imagined. His emotions are always righteous without exception. But many people might go a different direction. And rather than thinking that God has lots of emotions just like us, they might feel those emotions are a little bit more contained, that he's detached from those emotions. And the idea here is that um, emotions can cause turmoil in us. They can cause conflict within our own hearts, and they can cause a lot of trouble in our lives. And if God is really peaceful and tranquil, he must either not have emotions at all or have them in a greatly toned down way in comparison to us. But um, God's emotions are in perfect harmony with his will and his purposes and with each other. His emotions never get out of control and, and affect his behavior or cause chaos in his heart. We might lose our temper. We might get frozen with anxiety. Our hearts might 
might be full of controlling or conflicting emotions, but God's heart never works that way. See, God is never a victim of his emotions. They never work against his wills and purposes or against each other. They're always in perfect harmony. And so God can have emotions and have them greatly and yet still have complete peace. Now, finally, and I think this one happens most often among Christians, we have to think that God's kind of like an outraged father. I mean, we know how sinful we are. We know he's holy and doesn't like sin. And so we can't imagine how he wouldn't be frustrated and angry and disappointed with us all the time for all that we do but shouldn't and don't do but should. But God isn't like an outraged father, ashamed of our failures and at the brink of disowning us if we don't get our acts together. His emotions are never circumstantial and changing. Instead, they're eternal. What I mean by this is that once he sets his love upon someone, nothing they can do or decide can change God's decision or his love. His emotions are eternal and not passing and not changing. And as a consequence, they're not really even dependent upon our behavior in this way. They don't rise and fall depending upon what we do. Instead, they're not really responsive to actions. His emotions depend instead and are dependent upon and responsive to his eternal purposes, his plan for this universe. And that plan is perfect. If it's perfect, then it doesn't develop, it doesn't change, because if it could develop or change, it wouldn't have been perfect. But since it's perfect, it remains static and beautiful and wonderful. And if his love is dependent upon his perfect plan, which isn't changing, his love doesn't change either. Do you see what I'm doing there? His purposes and his love are tied together and they are unchanging. We see this, we already saw this back in verse one, because why did Israel call why did God call Israel his son? It wasn't because they were lovable. It wasn't because they are lovely. It was because God is loving and he chose in his plan to love them. So nothing Israel could do could change that. Even in their complete rejection of him, God, we see his heart aching for them, going out to them and choosing to love them, even though they're choosing to reject him. See, if God's love isn't dependent upon our behavior, then it will not change when we sin. If he set his love on us, then we are always loved. What we're seeing here is that our instincts and our thoughts about how God's heart works are often wrong. His heart is different than ours are. In fact, God is very different than we are completely, as he reminds us in verse 9 and says, for I am God and not a man, the holy one in your midst. It's kind of scary, isn't it? God's holiness. I mean, isn't that dangerous for sinners like us? Because holiness means perfection, not even a hint of sin, no evil at all. In fact, God hates evil because he's holy. But holiness also means set apart or separate. And as it applies to God, it means that he is so set apart that he is in a, in a class entirely of his own. There is nothing and no one in all of existence that is like God in his perfection and in his, his purity, and in his heart. He is entirely, entirely holy. Now, this holiness, see, what we're seeing is that it points not only to his purity, but how different he is than us. And so we're not quite sure what to expect from a God who is completely holy. But one thing we do expect is how verse 9 should read. We think it should read, for I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst. And because of that, I will come in wrath, right? After all, God's holiness is the danger. That's why a holy God can't live among a sinful people, isn't it? Because we're in danger of his punishment for our sins. We're in danger of being cast out eternally from his presence. So we think that holiness is the problem for us. But in fact, God points to his holiness not as the reason he will condemn us, but as the reason he will forgive us. Do you see that? God says, because he's the holy one and not a human being, he will not come in wrath. He's saying, first of all, that if we were in his position, we would come in wrath, but because he's not like us, he won't. And you know what? I, I get what he's saying there because I know my own heart. 
I'm, I'm kind of a nice guy, but um, cut me off on the highway or butt in front of me in a line. And, and boy, my hearts, my, my thought and hearts, they turn dark in a hurry. If, if I see this in myself towards strangers who haven't really done anything that terrible to me, how much worse if I were in God's position? Put yourself in this position for a moment. You have loved this people completely, though they didn't deserve it. You've given to them and given to them and called them and called them, and they reject you and they turn from you, and all they do is sit against you. How would you respond? Well, I know what I would do. I'd say, we're done. I I've given you enough chances. You're not worthy of my love, and I'd probably even condemn them. But that isn't what God does. That's not how he works. See, God responds differently to our constant sin, our bentness, as verse 7 described it, our bentness up to turning away from him. And he does this because he's holy. He responds in forgiveness and love because he is the holy one. That's the reverse of what we expect. We think his holiness is a threat but in fact, it is our only hope. And that's a, that's a wonderful thought. See, if our failures and our sins and the consequences that, it, that we face as a result of them, it, verse 8 tells us, tells us his heart in the middle of that, it recoils from thinking of condemning us. But instead, in the middle of our sin and rebellion, it says, his compassions grow warm and tender toward us. That's remarkable, isn't it? That's not how we normally think about God's heart and feeling toward us when we're sinning, that his compassions would grow warm and tender toward us, but that's what we're reading here. In his great book, Gentle and Lowly, pastor and author Dane Ortland said this of these verses. When we sin, the very heart of Christ is drawn out to us. And this isn't something all that new because Romans 5 tells us where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. He loved us while we were still sinners. Do you see that? God's first response is to give grace, is to provide a means of restoration, not condemn. When God's children sin, he does not respond in wrath, but he responds with grace and compassion. The incredible thing that we're seeing here in Hosea 11 is that God's heart goes out to you in your sin. His compassion is aroused by the suffering that necessarily comes as a consequence of all sin in this world. And that makes a certain amount of sense to us, doesn't it? Because we feel something like this too. And when we see someone we love suffer, our heart goes out to them more than normal, doesn't it? Whether that's a child that's struggling or a loved one who is sick we feel our compassion and our tenderness grow warm don't we uh, I, I experienced this with my own parents I never felt so much compassion and tenderness to them as when they were going through terminal cancer it, it drew my heart out to them because I loved them well we saw in verses five to seven, that Israel's rejection of God, as foolish as that was, it brought a great deal of suffering upon Israel. Now, Thomas Goodwin, one of the great Puritan thinkers of the, sixth, of the 17th century, said this about sin, suffering, and the heart of God. And I, it's a little long, but I want us to go through this. The language is a little tricky, but it's worth reading. The greater the misery is, the more is the pity when the party is beloved. So, in other words, the more you love someone, the more pity and mercy you'll have on them, compassion you'll have for them when they suffer. Now, of all misery, sin is the greatest. And while you look at it as such, Christ will look upon it as such also. In other words, sin causes the most suffering in this world. It's the greatest source of suffering. And he continues, and he, uh, and he that's Christ, and he, loving your person and hating only the sin, his hatred shall all fall, and that only upon the sin to free you of it by its ruin and destruction. But his affections shall be all the more drawn out to you. And this as much when you lie under sin as any other affliction, therefore fear not. And we're going to unpack that a little bit more as we go through the sermon. But for now, we can say that as a father or a mother feels compassion 
for their child when they're struggling and suffering, even if they foolishly brought that suffering upon themselves, the parent still feels compassion for them. If that's true of us, how much more so is that true of our loving heavenly father and we in our foolishness suffering from our sin? See, this brings us back to that metaphor of God as a heavenly father who loves us and we as his children. And here we're tempted to push away from a metaphor like that because we're afraid that it might not do justice to God's holiness. It might not quite accurately reflect the way his heart works. We don't want to humanize God. And well, we shouldn't because he is not like us. He is the holy one in our midst. He's God and not a man. But um, his holiness, how different he is than us, doesn't mean he feels less than us, but that he feels more more deeply. His emotion is stronger. God's emotions are perfect. They're unchanging and they're good, just like he is. He's God and his love is as greater than ours as is his power or his knowledge. So rather than than pushing away from a metaphor of God as a loving heavenly father and us as children, we need to lean into it even more. See, his love is nothing like our divided, our fading, our undependable love. His love is greater by far. For kids who are listening to this, I hope you know that your parents love you deeply. They're not perfect by far, but they do love you very, very much. And for parents, I know that you love your kids. You you would die for them. That's how much you love them. Understand that this love as great as it is, is but a shabby reflection, a a shadow only of God's infinite, incredible, never-ending love for those who he has called his own children. The Bible scholar scholar Derek Kidner said that we're not in danger of um, reading too much into this father-son metaphor, but of reading too little into it. If you're a believer, your heavenly father loves you with an everlasting love that will not fade or diminish for all of eternity, let alone fade or diminish in response to your sin and your failure. His love isn't like that. And praise God for that. Now, I don't know who needs to hear this this morning, but I want you to understand that God could not possibly love you more than he does right now in this moment. His love is perfect. And because it is perfect, it doesn't change when you sin. It's just as strong. It's just as great as it ever has been and it always will be. There's nothing you can do to make God love you less. And as a consequence, there's nothing you can do to make God love you more either. His love is that great. This is the divine love that God has placed upon his children. That's a love that you can depend upon. That's a love that you can trust in and turn to when life gets difficult. Hosea's love for his unfaithful wife, Gomer, as inspiring and amazing as that is, is nothing in comparison of God's love for his own. We need to remind ourselves of that this morning. Are are you letting your heart hear this this morning? Are you pulling back your defense mechanisms? Are, Are you letting your apathy be set aside, your coldness turn away, distractions get pushed out of your mind? Are you hearing how much God loves you right now? despite, not because of, but despite all your mistakes. And God will always love you that way. And think about this. If God loves you like that, what in all of existence can stand against such a love? What are you worrying about? What are you afraid of when God loves you with a love like this? You will never lose his love. He'll never have second thoughts about you. He'll never get bored of you. His love doesn't fail. God's heart goes out to you, even, even in the midst of our sin. Look at the determination 
of verse 9 that results in God's compassionate heart for sinners. I will not execute my burning anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim. There's a divine determination here that is born from God's love to spare and have compassion on his people. But you may have noticed that little word again. I will not again destroy Ephraim. Ephraim is just another name for Israel. Um, what's going on here? Well, God, God's love does not exclude his discipline. We've seen that already. In fact, his love leads to his discipline. It doesn't, it doesn't block it out. It's the reason why he disciplines. God will do whatever it takes to remove sinful habits and actions from you because he hates sin and he knows it's hurting you and he loves you. So he will do what it takes to get rid of it. For Israel, that meant he let them go into exile because he knew the trials, the suffering, and the difficulty of exile would teach them in a way that they just wouldn't listen to what he told them. That experience would teach them that they need God. The worldly council, their own ideas aren't as good as God's ideas. That other gods and other things that they might worship in their lives aren't worthy of their worship. Only he is. And it would teach them to value his incredible, his incredible love. So, we need to see, though, that he will not discipline forever. Ephraim won't be totally or permanently destroyed, but God will restore them. But how can God discipline and not destroy? I mean, if his justice demands punishment, does he just ignore it? Does love cancel out his justice? Well, no, because we've seen he's the holy one. He loves us in perfection, and that perfection includes perfect justice. His love for his children and his anger and his wrath over their sin work in perfect harmony and that seems to contradict that <coughs> excuse me that seems to make no sense until we look to the cross see not only does god call himself the holy one in your midst and i'm god and not a man but in jesus he literally became the holy one in our midst when he took on humanity you see, Jesus was God the Son, and he came down in his full holiness to become like us, to identify with us. But he lived a perfect life, unlike us, and yet he still died on the, sin, on the cross for sin. But that sin wasn't his own, it was ours. See, God poured out his wrath over our sins upon Jesus so that he could pour out his forgiveness, pour out his compassion and his love upon us because of Jesus. And Jesus satisfied the holy and just commands and demands of God's justice and his wrath over our sin. And at the same time as satisfying those demands, he demonstrated God's holy and loving purposes for sinners like us. See, justice and love worked in perfect harmony upon the cross. If we will turn from our sin in repentance and in faith accept Christ's death in our place on the cross, we will be forgiven. We will be saved. And God will make us his sons and daughters. And in doing so, he will set that never-ending, never-changing, relentless love upon us forever. You know what? He will never disown you, and he will never leave you. His love will be as strong for you always as today as when we get to heaven, if you will accept this. See, I pray that if you're here this morning and, and you're not a Christian, that this view of the beauty of his love would make you want it, and that you would accept your own unworthiness of it, admit your sin, and then turn to Christ as the one who died for you. If you do that, you will become a child of God and you will know this love that surpasses all knowledge. But God's love doesn't just lead his compassion out, but as we'll see in verses uh, 10 and 11, it also leads him to secure our future. Let's look at that right now. It says, they shall go after the Lord he will roar like a lion. When he roars, his children shall come trembling from the west. They shall come trembling like birds from Egypt and like doves from the land of Assyria. And I will return them to their homes, declares the Lord. So here 
we read that God's love, what God's love does when he places it upon sinners who live in rebellion. Yes, he gave them up to exile, but uh, we saw how he yearned for them through their suffering in exile, how his heart and his compassion swelled up for them. Verse 10 isn't the first time that God has been pictured as a lion, is it? Back in chapter 5, we saw that God was like a lion preying upon Israel. The picture there was him using his fierce power in disciplining punishment of them. But now it's different. God roars like a lion, not against his people, but to deliver his people. And the nations respond in, in fear. They give up the people. And, and the people, they respond too. Finally, they answer the call. They, they, when they hear that call roaring forth, they're not going to turn away. They're not going to ignore. But this time they're going to come. But they come different because they come trembling. This means that their hearts have changed. Now they fear God. And fearing God means that they respect and honor his power and his holiness. Their hearts have been changed. Some of that bentness has been straightened out and healed. Now, verse 11 pictures Israel as birds or doves. And that's, again, not the first time we've seen that. Back in chapter 7, we, we saw how uh, Israel was like a, a senseless bird fluttering and flitting from one tree to the next. One tree was Egypt, the other tree was Assyria, and this represented their political flip-flopping, how they were putting their hope in all the wrong places without any kind of stability and without any kind of sense or wisdom. They were trusting in nations that couldn't save them and not in a God who could. But now God pictures them as birds in migration, returning to where they belong. God brings them back to their homes. What Hosea is telling us is that if God's heart goes out to us in our sin, it goes out to us to restore us. He won't let us stay in that sin. He loves us too much to do that. He brings us back. He brings his scattered ones home. And this looks forward to the great day when God calls us home to be with himself forever, to enjoy his presence, his glory, and his love for eternity. On that day, our hearts will finally and fully be healed. All of that bentness finally straightened forever. His love will do this for sinners like us. A love that didn't shrink away from us in our rebellion, but swelled up in compassion, in a, restore, a restoring love, in reaching out to us in our broken state and healing us. A love that absorbed the wrath of God for our sins upon the cross. And a love that helps us to walk in life, just like a, a father holding his toddler's hand and watching his stumbling steps. Listen, God loves you more than you can possibly imagine. This passage has shown us that God loves you as his child. He'll never disown you, but God disciplines those he loves. He'll allow hard times in our lives until we learn to come back to him. But this is an abandonment. Far, far from it. God's heart recoils from the very thought of condemning you forever or of, of leaving you behind. Instead, God's heart goes out to you even in your sin to restore you, to bring you back to peace and harmony with himself and fellowship with him. No matter what happens, his love will never give up on you. You'll never lose it. It is entirely relentless. God will never stop loving you. Do you know that this morning? God, if, if you are a child of God, he will never stop loving you. In the midst of your failure, in the midst of your sin, in the midst of falling down again, in the midst of running away from him, in your coldness, in your distance, in your apathy, God loves you with this same deep, abiding, perfect love. Brothers and sisters, take comfort from that thought. And may his eternal, unchanging, infinite love motivate you to come back to him. My prayer for you is that you would have sweet thoughts of God's love for the rest of this week. And some of this would implant more deeply in your heart.
and you would carry a little bit better knowledge of that love that you will help you to face difficulties and trials that may come your way in the future. And more than anything else, brothers and sisters, a love like this, it's worth giving your whole life to. It's worth worshiping. It's worth following. It's worth trusting. Because God will never, never, never stop loving you. Let's pray. God, we've been thinking about deep things this morning. Things too deep for our minds to fully grasp. Your love is infinite and it's unchanging. And we don't have anything quite like that. Yes, by your grace and mercy, you let us know love. But not a love like this. God, may you teach us to know this love that is unknowable. May you teach us to enter more deeply into the experience of this beautiful love. And God, may it fill us and overflow from us. Because this love is worth sharing. As it's infinite, it doesn't run out. God, help us to tell others about your love. Lord, if there's anyone in the meeting this morning and they don't quite know that love yet, may you draw them with cords of kindness and bonds of love further and deeper into your love. May you save them, O oh Lord. May they give, give, give uh, up on turning from you and give in to that love. May they confess their sins and put their faith in Christ. And Father, for those this morning who are your own, your children, but living in rebellion, running from you, when you call, they run further away. They're deep, deep in sin and shame. God, may your love pierce their hearts this morning. May they give up on their sin, stop loving it more than they love you, and know that even in the middle of their sin, you've never stopped loving them, not even by a little bit. God, your love is astounding. We thank you for it. We don't know how to thank you enough because we can't. But we praise you. We worship you because you truly are a God of love. We pray, Lord, that you will teach us how to know and experience and tell others about this love. In Jesus' name, amen.